You're listening to Protecting What Matters, a podcast by the Ohio Department of Commerce. Commerce is Ohio's chief regulator, and we play a vital role in keeping you safe by protecting your property, your money, and some of the products you use every day. This podcast is designed to bring awareness to important issues and help educate consumers and businesses. Join us as we chat with trusted industry experts focused on providing you with the tools you need to help you protect what matters most in your life. One of the things that I, I love about this series is that it's, it's telling the story of the people behind the product. I think so many times in our society we, we get excited about a product or we have this materialistic bent and we don't think about the people, the stories, the process, the craft that goes into making it. I'm Kristen Castle, Director of Brand and Marketing Strategy for Ohio Liquor, also known as OHLQ. Have you ever stopped to think about the farmers who make your favorite spirit possible? It all started on a farm somewhere when the right combination of seed, soil, warmth, and water sprouted a plant that would grow for a season and then be mashed, fermented, distilled, aged, and bottled. In this episode of Protecting What Matters, we highlight OHLQ's new series that features the individuals who help craft your favorite spirits from seed to sip. But despite my brief tenure on the Madison Plains FFA agronomy judging team, I could not talk about this new series without Andy Vance, an incredibly talented leader in the food and agriculture industry who is truly at the heart of this series. Thank you for being here, Andy. Thanks for having me, Kristen. I'm excited to talk about the series. Yes, Andy, this is a new and exciting direction for Ohio Liquor. Um, can you tell me about your reaction when you were presented with the opportunity and why it was difficult to say no to it, given your incredible background? Yeah, you know, this, this is such an exciting project for me personally. One, because my background is, is in agriculture. I grew up on a farm, got dirt under my fingernails, as we often say in the industry, even though I live here in the Columbus Metro. But one of the things that I, I love about this series is that it's, it's telling the story of the people behind the product. I think so many times in our society, we, we get excited about a product or we have this materialistic bent and we don't think about the people, the stories, the process, the craft that goes into making it. Well, when you think about spirits, and we can be talking about, I like Scotch whiskey, mm -hmm. I like bourbon, I like I have a cupboard full of you know, good tequila, all of these things that you find in your local HLQ store. There, there's a story behind every one of those bottles. Many times you don't know them. You just, oh, I like the way this tastes, or I like to mix this in this favorite cocktail, depending on the season. But taking the time, so that's a lot of what uh, I, as an agricultural journalist, have really enjoyed during my career is telling the stories of the people really behind the Really humanizing the process, which is, oh, yeah. is, is exactly what we had sought out to do with this, um, with this new series. But to do that, we first had to understand the landscape. Um, so we needed to see or hear from our suppliers from where they were sourcing their grains. Um, and after that initial survey, we were led to um, Rustic Brew Farms, and wow, that was a great story to kick off the series. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, meeting the fourth generation farmer uh, that you did um, in Marysville, and, and a little bit about his background and his story, and kind of what he's what he's doing for Ohio Spirits? Matt Cunningham, as you mentioned, a fourth generation farmer, Union County outside of Marysville. Rustic Brew Farm is, is his vision. And I think the perfect person to kick off this new series, trying to, to humanize the story and in the agricultural component, the farm side of right. the spirits industry. People may not realize this, but Ohio has this really wonderful craft spirits industry. And we're gonna talk about national brands as well as, as local, but there's this wonderful craft spirits industry in Ohio. And Matt is the perfect avatar for that because as I've met distillers and farmers as part of this series, you find out that there are so many commonalities mm -hmm. between the founders of, let's say, a distillery like Echo Spirits or Hall Brothers and a farmer like Matt Cunningham. 
they they have an intense curiosity they have a love of the process of the craft so what matt had done you know he's farming with his dad as we mentioned he's the fourth generation the the family's been tending the land for low these many years but it's a hard business and there are challenges of of you know everything is more expensive today than it was when dad started farming mm -hmm. how do you feed a family uh, multiple families in the case where you have dad and and a son as, as you had here with Matt and his dad farming together how do you feed both families on the same amount of land what do the economics of that look like so Matt was really looking at how do I diversify my business mm -hmm. in essence mm -hmm. a lot of times you don't think about farming as a business it's this avocation but it is a business how do I diversify my business we get to looking around and huh we have this growing craft brewery industry in Ohio there's the, the, the beer boom well hey I well, what do you make beer out of? Well, it's malt, hops, barley, et cetera. And you got to thinking, hey, we could grow barley I here. I could do that. I could do exactly <laughs> right. 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 And so he did. And so he started experimenting with a little bit of experimentation. He starts malting these grains that they're already growing on the farm. Sure. And, and he starts with just a little, kind of almost a test setup, small scale, figured out, hey, I can malt this stuff and it's good. And he starts working with some brewers and they're buying it and it's good. <laughs> So then it kind of keeps growing from there. And he really got focused in on the distilling side as well. And he starts okay. meeting some craft distillers. And, and what's amazing when you go to Matt's farm is you can see, like, I started over here in this building with this very small setup. And then we needed to grow. And so then we built this bigger. He's engineered so much of his, his what he calls his malting room, these big, there are these huge stainless steel cylinders, mm -hmm. big cylinders set on their side that just rotate. And, and help sprout these grains. That's what the malting is. Uh, and so he's built all this himself and he's learned from engineers, he's learned from uh, the brewers and the distillers and others who are in this space. And he just keeps experimenting and trying and how do we make the product better? And it's worked and it's really wonderful. And he's a great example because he's not the only one in the state doing that. There sure. are others. Right. They help each other, they talk to one another, you know, and, and so many times when we would be on a, um, a farm visit or we'd be at a distillery mm -hmm. and we'd say, oh, we did this story with Matt and this person from the other side of the state would be like, oh yeah, I know Matt, he helped me with this. They're almost a family within themselves, well, right? We, because yeah. they, are, they are truly a network of, of teammates that are doing this, that, that, are, that are trying to accomplish the same thing, which is bettering the, the, the industry. Yeah, and because this industry is, uh, the, the spirits industry at large, you know, one, it, it's a lot of fun. The people in it sure. understand that their job is not a normal nine to five. You know, I can't believe I'm doing this for a living, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, so yeah, it's a great right. example. Like when we went to uh, we went to Echo, um, we went to Echo, and, and we're talking with the founders of that. <laughs> you know, these are like IT guys, or they're they were in engineering. Or, you know, they're right. they're very normal. You know, work a day jobs. And they're like, we want to do something different. So we decided to make whiskey. You yeah. Know? It, I mean, there's, there's that. <laughs> and so they're all, one, they're having fun. But mm -hmm. two, as competitive as that space is, there's a lot of room, right? So you can make it today. Maybe you couldn't have 20 years ago. Sure. Maybe, the, maybe the national brands had it all in lockdown. But the barriers to entry are lower, still high, but lower. Right. So that you have this explosion of small scale craft, artisanal, and, and you can go and give it a shot. So they do, they talk, they help each other. Mm -hmm. It's competitive, but it's not cutthroat. Right, and, a, and collaborative, yeah. in a, which, is, which is fantastic. We all know we can do more together. That's right. So that's, that's a really, um, that's a great uh, story there. You had mentioned um, national brands. Um, you know, Ohio does have a lot of incredible distillers but buying local grains just isn't, you know, an Ohio thing. Right. Um, as I mentioned, we had surveyed all of our suppliers, um, which initially led us to Rustic Brew Farms, but it also led us to Maker's Mark, um, a very popular brand um, here across the country. Um, and actually, that's where you and I first met yes. um, at, at Maker's Mark, um, just about 70 miles southwest of Lexington. Um, can you tell us about that incredible experience? I mean, we, we, I learned, personally learned a lot, but tell us kind of through your lens what you, you spent more time than I did, but tell us kind of what, what you um, saw and learned there, Andy. You know, I'm a fan of Maker's Mark, you know, the spirit, and, and that's one of, my, my cocktail of choice is the old fashioned. So you sure. know what makes a great old fashioned? <laughs> Maker's Mark. That's it makes right. a wonderful old fashioned. So I was very excited about the trip to begin with. But the reason we went to Maker's Mark 
was because they have this wonderful distillery in the middle of one of the most beautiful farms I've ever visited. And so part of the Maker's Mark story, inextricably linked to the spirit itself, mm -hmm. is the farm. And so if you drive 70 miles outside of Lexington and you go through these rolling hills of rural Kentucky and you think, oh, we're never going to get there. I did think that a couple of times. Actually. You, you start <laughs> seeing rick houses popping right. up. And, and you know, it's if beautiful. you go across the Midwest, uh, you see silos and grain bins, you know, just the way they mm -hmm. dot the landscape in Indiana, Illinois, Iowa. Well, in Kentucky, it's rick houses. Mm -hmm. And so you start seeing these rick houses pop up alongside all these roads and you start seeing the signs for different distilleries some you've heard of some you've never heard of newer older ones that have been there for a million years and you get to makers and the farmstead itself is beautiful and the story behind star hill farms is that the samuels family founded makers mark again multi-generational mm -hmm. distilling family they wanted to restart a distillery the family had been in it and one thing and another they had kind of been out of it wanted to get back in well they found this farm and they wanted to buy the farm because there are these wonderful ponds, bodies of water, Kentucky's limestone rich terra firma, mm -hmm. have these wonderful farm ponds and that, that limestone interacting with the water does something to the water that makes it a far better water for making whiskey. And so they start and they buy this old grist mill on this farm and they turn it into the distillery and basically Maker's Mark is made on that farm today in that distillery, in that former grist mill, the same was in 1953 mm -hmm. when they bought the place. Mm -hmm. But to see you know, that, that the process, while sure things have been somewhat modernized and whatnot, sure. and, you know, the, 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 the process is consistent and you know, sort of modern manufacturing and all that sort of thing, but it doesn't feel that way when you walk into that distillery and there are these big cypress vats full of mash just bubbling Correct. away and you're like i've stepped back in time yes and the passion that every person we met there had for the product and not just the end product but every step of the process mm -hmm. so you're going around star hill farm and you see over here here's a test plot of barley one of the things that's cool about maker's mark is the corn the wheat that go into that mash bill come from within 60 miles of the distillery. The corn within 30 miles, the, the uh, uh, wheat within 60 miles. But barley doesn't grow as well in Kentucky as mm -hmm. it does in the upper Midwest. Typically you find barley in the upper plains, right? Right. Uh, you know, the Dakotas, Minnesota, up toward Canada, that sort of thing. We do grow in Ohio here. Mm -hmm. S several of the people we've met here are, are growing barley. Mm -hmm. But it's a more challenging grain to sure. grow doesn't do as well in Kentucky. The climate is enough different, the soils, the weather, all of these things that go into how you raise corn, wheat, rye, and barley, the foundational grains and spirits. So what Maker's Mark is doing at Star Hill Farm is working with the University of Kentucky to figure out, hey, are there varieties of barley that we could grow here? Mm -hmm. And so here's this plot of land right next to the visitor center that has 200 different varieties of barley that they're testing to see which ones grow, which ones don't, which ones can a local farmer raise profitably to sell to us, because that's the one thing they're not mm -hmm. able to source locally that's in their right. mash bill. Mm -hmm. uh, you drive around and, hey, here are these stands of oak trees. Here's, here's this plot of oak trees that, again, they're partnering with the University of Kentucky to say, how do we protect our white oak? Because white oak is an integral part of making bourbon, because guess what we age this bourbon in? White oak barrels. So they're doing research to figure out how do, we, how do we support sustainably producing this product for the long haul. I asked one of the, the ladies who was taking us on the tour, I said something about how long they anticipated that project going on. She said, this project will outlive all of us. These trees will be here. And, and she was serious. She's right. Well, right. she's right. Yeah, because too. you think about right. how, how, how long you know, it takes to grow an oak tree to maturity such right. that you're going to be able to turn it into how many ever staves make a barrel. Right. And, and she said, with all that sincerity, this project will outlive us. But that's what they're trying to do there is how do we make this product that we all love sustainably for the long haul? How do we help our, our farmers? How do we help the, the landowners who grow those trees mm -hmm. that then go to our cooperage and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth? So there are all these neat little things like that that are happening on that farm. That it was it was a great um, experience for me, and I I found that 
you know, the work that, that they're doing um, with the university was very impressive, um, encouraging. Um, but Andy, everything you just described is, you know, illustrative that farming is a science. It, yeah. it truly is. And you were able to um, also meet with um, a gentleman who um, is actually a farmer and a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, I, can you tell us, I mean, that's just, it's, it's incredible. Can you tell us a little bit about Greg and your experience with talking with him? Yeah, one of our latest stories in the series uh, just, just dropped on the website, you know, within the last week or so. It was about Dr. Greg McGlinch at Down Home Farms mm -hmm. uh, over in Dark County. You know, out there in the field, you're, you're looking at your, your soil pH, your soil fertility. Mm -hmm. You're looking at, do I need to apply nitrogen or phosphorus? Do, do I need to try to alter or amend the soil in some way so that the plants can grow in more favorable growing conditions? Can, can they produce more bushels of corn, wheat, barley, rye, etc.? And, and you might say, well, why, why is producing more bushels important? Well, it's important because part of sustainability is doing more with less. So if a farmer can produce more bushels of that grain on the same number of acres, then that farmer is using less fuel, less of other inputs, so they're more sustainable with their, with their given footprint. So the science part of all of this is figuring out what are the different biological levers mm -hmm. that I can pull to get a desired outcome. Now, it may not just be more yield. It may be a distiller saying to a farmer, you know, I'd like a higher starch content. I'd like a higher protein content in my grain, or I'd like less of this or more of that or whatever it might be. It might be that different varieties produce a different sugar content, which changes what happens in our mash bill and, and all that sort of thing. So these are all different things that a farmer has to be cognizant of. Dr. McGlinch takes it to the extreme. So every farmer has this sort of base mm -hmm. level of required knowledge. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they all went to school and studied agronomy. It just right. means these are things that you learn. Why are many of these farms multi-generational? Because there are some of those, those tools um, that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And so Dr. McGlinch, um, you know, had been farming with the family, again, multi-generation mm -hmm. farm. He'd studied, you know, uh, as an undergraduate and got really interested in this. And then he was, he was an agricultural educator, that is a high school mm -hmm. VOAG teacher. And, you know, said he really enjoyed teaching and all that, but his, his heart and passion was there on the farm. I started thinking about, again, how can we diversify our operations? Start looking around, got this real interest in cereal grains. And so started his master's uh, and was studying cereal grains. In other words, you're talking about rye and, mm -hmm. and, and barley and, and wheat. So he's studying that as a graduate student and became something of an expert in it and had the opportunity then to go on and pursue his doctorate. And so it spent these years wow. completing a doctoral degree studying specifically these cereal grains. And so now, I mean, if there's an expert on how to grow cereal grains for the spirits industry in Ohio, it's Greg McGlinch. That's incredible. And, and so what's really cool about his story is you know, you, when you think about a scientist, I think a lot of us immediately default to white lab coat, you know, in, in the lab, mm -hmm. beakers and bottles and right. so on and so forth. He's doing it out in the field every day. Uh, now, you know, I would, I would be lying if I said I had met a bunch of farmers who were walking around with PhDs. It's not that common. Sure. But I would say this, many of the uh, university professors I've known at Ohio State over the years in agricultural disciplines still own and operate a farm. That passion runs really? deep. Yeah, yes. so it is, there's this interesting relationship in the industry between the science and, and the learning. Um, I could give a plug for the land grant mission at our, our universities and why that's super important because that's where most of this mm -hmm. innovation happens that allows us to be more sustainable mm -hmm. on the farm growing these grains that then turn into our favorite products. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, the story with Greg was just a treat. and. I learn something every time I talk to you. Yeah, him. That's, I, I thought that that was fascinating, and, and I'm glad that you had the opportunity to, mm -hmm. to be able to talk to him, and he could you know, contribute to this, to this series. It's, it's such an interesting um, perspective. Um, and Andy, I know we talked about kind of humanizing um, the process, and from the onset of this um, project, we also wanted to kind of educate our consumers on respecting the process yeah. as well. Um, 
thereby resulting in you know respecting the drink and um, social responsibility to Ohio Liquor is a key pillar to what we do. It's it's woven into every every part of of our work. Um, we're very proud of that work. It's it's um, it's just a it's it's our mission to include that and you know we provide resources for parents on how to talk to children about um, you know underage consumption and the dangers and, and responsible consumption and mocktail recipes so this was just another kind of natural project for us to uh, you know weave that social responsibility into it because as you've described so eloquently what goes into our favorite spirit that that has gone undergone a you know an incredibly complex and thoughtful process and we should really you know respect that that drink just a little bit more knowing how much work has gone into that um so i i appreciate you you sharing all of that because i think that that um you know the the social responsibility part of this is it's it's hard to you know yeah. It's hard not to, to kind of call that out and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and I think about it this way, you know, my first exposure to to really quality spirits, which is which is what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. um, I, for whatever reason, got interested in, in scotch, you know, and, <laughs> and that's not really what we're focused on in this mm -hmm. series because, you know, we're not really growing scotch whiskey in central Ohio, but... <laughs> but it's always good to talk was, about scotch. That was, well, that was my, I mean, that was my first exposure to... Um, you know what I'll, I'll call like real adult, <laughs> like yes. serious, not college. Yes. I, you know. Right. So what I what I always think about is a mature you know, drinker. I mean, in your yeah, and, and so I found out that uh, one, I really enjoyed it, but two, because I enjoyed it so much, and and this was something that I was going to savor. It wasn't a That's means. Right. It wasn't a means to an end. That's right. So you know, I go and 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 buy myself a really nice bottle of scotch for my birthday. And that's going to last me for mm -hmm. a while because I'm I'm going to enjoy it. It's it's not a means to an end. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, I had a I had a bad exam during finals week and I need to forget this. That's not what we're talking. You know, right. so this series to me was was an expansion of my experience getting to learn and love. You know, really quality handcrafted spirits. And, and getting that level of respect for, because I did, I read about the distiller, you know, the, God bless the internet, you can learn anything about anything. That's right. I found this particular uh, scotch that I liked, and so I start reading about the distillery and the history of it, and watching YouTube videos with the mm -hmm. master distiller talking mm -hmm. about the process. And so the more I learned about it, the more I respected it. And I, I think that's a huge part of the story. And certainly with, um, so then of course, that was my gateway into bourbon and sure. uh, a number of sure. other, you know, spirits that I've gotten to know and love during mm -hmm. the process of writing this series. You, the more you respect something, you know, the more I think you can savor it and the less likely you are to abuse it. That's right. I th savor is a, the operative word there. That's, that's a great, great word to use. Um, so Andy, we're still in the middle of, of harvest season. Can you talk to us a little bit about, or maybe give us some teasers as what's what's yet to come in, in the Seed to Sip series? Yeah, the stories that are upcoming that I'm super excited about. I've been working really hard on a story about uh, um, Woodenville, mm -hmm. and it's another great distillery that has a, a story that is, is so very similar to whether we were talking about Maker's Mark and, and their process, but, but a lot more um, like some of these, these craft distilleries here in Ohio we've talked about. But it all started with, you know, founders who were really curious and excited in, in crafting a really high quality spirit. And in so doing, met a farmer, mm -hmm. multi-generation farm family, and the relationship between the distiller and the farmer, I have found in so many of these cases, collaborative, collegial, but to where one is almost an extension of the other, even though they're wow. separate businesses. Mm -hmm. The distillers speak with such love and passion about the farmers that produce their product. And in many cases, they're buying their grains from just one farmer. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, and so that's the case with Woodenville where, you know, they're looking at our grains come from this one particular family. And so as I was doing one of the interviews for the story, I think it's talking about how the farmer says to the distiller, you need more storage space. We're going to build, in essence, a rickhouse out here on the farm so you can age this whiskey. Wow. And they just, get, and so the partnership That's between great. the farm 
and the distillery, you know, the separate businesses that sure. have grown together. And, and it was funny because that farm family started out essentially, you know, doing barley in a pretty small scale. Now they're the largest barley grower in the state. All because of this, wow. this interconnected growth between Woodenville and the farm. So that's one that's really that's exciting. Great. Um, had a wonderful conversation with Dorothy Palanda, who is director of the Ohio Department yes. of Agriculture. Uh, again, another you know person who grew up on her family farm out in Union County. Um, and it was funny because we got to talking with her just about the role that Ohio spirits industry, and, and she talked a lot about the, the brewery and, and uh, the vineyard industries as well, because mm -hmm. her role at the Department of Agriculture is similar across all those industries right. and all have been on a growth trajectory over the past 20 years in the state and become an important part of Ohio's agriculture story. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were talking with her about stories in the series and Matt Cunningham's name comes up. She's like, oh my gosh, I've known, you know, and you start singing It's a Small World After That's All. That's right, right. Because she was from the county and served in the House of Representatives for his family's district and all oh, that sort of thing. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so, and has this great sort of 30,000 foot view of the industry and what the spirits industry means as part of agriculture and vice versa and how those industries and, and the focus on local production. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been really fun. We're going to be back out at the Cunningham Farm during harvest. So okay. when the combines roll, we'll be checking in with Matt again to say, okay, we met you during planting. That's right. We saw the process of the seed going in the ground. How'd it go? That's right. <laughs> and so we'll we'll have that touch base back with him. Uh, and then one of the last stories we're doing in the series is, is a bit of a round table with the distillers. So we'll have spent the summer, you know, telling the story of the farmers that make the product, uh, and then we're going to meet the distillers and kind of get their perspective. So wonderful. Yeah, a great kind of a great way to finish the the series and the sure. season. So uh, a lot of content on the site now, and and more to come clear through harvest up uh, right up until kind of the holidays. So I, I think that this has probably been for me, one of the most fulfilling projects um, I've been a part of, both personally and professionally. And um, I am very appreciative that you took the time to, to talk with us today and kind of get us caught up to where we are so far and then all of the great things yet to come. And as, as Andy mentioned, everything we have published so far is on OHLQ.com. Um, be sure to sign up for our emails to follow along as well in the series. Um, and social media. Um, I want to thank Andy for being here with us today um, as we raise a glass responsibly to all of our farmers because as Andy so eloquently uh, described, we could not do uh, this without them and um, appreciate everybody listening in today on this episode of Protecting What Matters. <laughs>